You ever ask yourself, why do we have hazardous materials? Who in their right mind wouldn't synthesize a red dye that caused cancer? Who in their right mind would develop a plasticizer that causes birth defects? Why are we in the situation that we're in? Why is it that every time we open up the newspaper, every time we open up, you know, turn on a Google search or something like that, we're hearing about toxic this, toxic this, bad this, bad this. How did we get in this place? If we want to fix it, if we want to get to a world that doesn't have toxic materials, I think the critical question we have to ask is why do we have them in the first place? Right? I'm an industrial chemist. I'm the person that works for industry that invents the materials. I think we could, we could spend some time thinking about molecules, or we could spend some time thinking about how do we make chemists? Sperm side of stuff. Um, but how do we train our chemists? Right? I didn't start life as one of these boy wonder, you know, chemistry kids that grew up wanting to, to make molecules. And you know, I, I had no idea what chemistry was. I was, uh, had a huge Sicilian family in south of Boston. I, my mom had 11 brothers and sisters. I had 35 first cousins within a one mile radius growing up. <laughs> we were plumbers, electricians, carpenters. We didn't know what higher education was. We had no idea what college was. You know, I decided one day, crazily, that I was going to go to college. My family was a little bit put off by that. Well, you're going to be a professional student. Look at your brothers have excellent jobs. So I made a deal that I'd work construction while I went to undergraduate. I went to UMass Boston, $200 a semester while working full time in construction. And, but what was the most horrifying thing is what I went to school for. I was a music major. <laughs> Who would have thought? Um, and so I'm, I'm going to school, I'm taking classes, I'm a music major, I have a, a band, it's, you know, it's the typical high school, college band, but you know what the name of it was? The Elements. <laughs> not carbon, not hydrogen, not oxygen, not that stuff, it was a Rubik's Cube, some glass ball, you know, it was the early 80s, that's what we called The Elements. Um, we sounded a little bit like the cars with a little bit better lyrics, um, but... <laughs> Things were going good. We were, we were you know, recording. We, we actually had a couple recording contracts. We were playing three nights a week at some of the best slash worst bars in Boston. Things, <laughs> things were going, going well. And all of a sudden, the, the drummer of the band, my friend, got leukemia. And over the course of six months, he passed away. So um, I'm taking gen ed education. I have to take an English class, a science class, a, you know, a history class to get my, my degree. And I was taking chemistry to fulfill my chemistry requirement, my, my science requirement. Oh, well, it was probably the right time in the day, so I signed up for it. And, <laughs> and I'm in there taking, taking the class one day, and a, the professor that's teaching the lab comes in. And he walks into the lab, looks right at me, walks right by me, looks to the person next to me and says to the kid next to me, would you like to do research? Well, all of a sudden I'm not in a band, I got a lot of time on my hands, I overheard the conversation and I said, can I come? And I walked into the lab and I gotta tell you an epiphany happened. All my life because I have to be marginally good at music, I was an artist. And in the world there are two things, there are artists and there are scientists. And I was an artist. What would I do in science? To me, science was you do a calculation, put a number in a box, and then if you get it right, you get a check and a pat on the top of the head. If you get it wrong, you go back and you do it again. Um, not the most interesting career that I could imagine. Um, but when I got into the lab, it was like, wait a minute. Scientists create. Scientists make stuff. And I actually had this idea that if you rammed my head full of electrodes and sat at a piano and composed a piece of music or designed a molecule, I bet you the same neurons fired. And creativity is something that's special and wonderful and the word art and the word science is actually human language, but not reality. And once I got that and I figured out that I could be creative and do stuff, I, I said, okay, maybe I'll try this. And I went 
crazy into chemistry. So all the time that I was spending in, 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 the, in the music world, I now started to channel into chemistry. And so I, uh, 40, 50, 60 hours a week pouring beakers and flask, and I actually found out I was okay with this. I published like six papers as an undergraduate in peer-reviewed journals. By 19 years old, I spoke at the National Academy of Sciences in Washington on my research. In fact, I made the cover of Celebrity Magazine with Boy George. <laughs> Not as a musician, but as a chemist. The, the, the Celebrity Magazine calls me up one day and says, John Warner, we consider you one of Boston's best and brightest gra college graduates. Come and have your picture taken. I said, no, and I hung up the phone. They <laughs> call me back a little bit later. Really, we want you to come and have your picture. I go, really, and I hung up the phone. <laughs> well, the next day I go to school, and I'm working in the lab, and I'm pouring my beakers, I'm pouring my flasks and everything, and I'm working in the construction industry, so I've got a flannel shirt, I'm not shaved, I'm not as snappy dressed as I am now, and I'm, <laughs> I'm hiding, I'm hiding, and the chancellor of the university comes and bangs on the door and says, you will go get your picture taken. <laughs> and so kicking and screaming, they pull me with all these snappy dressed people and they do this story on how this kid has assembled a hundred molecules that have never existed in the universe before. Assembling unique atomic geometries into molecules that have never existed. Very poetic, very interesting. <laughs> Next thing you know, I come to the startling conclusion, I'm a chemist. How did that happen? Well, one thing leads to another, and I find myself at Princeton University in the medicinal chemistry program working with Professor E.C. Taylor. And I'm working on anti-cancer drug, and a wonderful group of people, and I actually came up with this, this molecule, a lot of people on this team, called Alimta, which is considered, you know, today the most successful anti-cancer drug in the history of pharmaceutical sciences. I published like 17 papers. My mom passed away in 2002 of lung cancer, receiving a derivative of the drug that I had designed 10 years earlier with, in graduate school. They talk about this weird relationship between science and society. It didn't extend her life, it just improved the quality so that she could, you know, she was actually driving herself to chemotherapy up until, you know, a few weeks before she passed away. Well, so Princeton's very proud of me. They take pictures of me in front of American flags and stories about this kid who's doing all these things. One day in my lab, the phone rings, and it's a corporate officer of the Polaroid Corporation. He calls me up, he says, John, I've been following your career. Remember when you were on Celebrity Magazine? I remember what you were doing. I'm thinking stalker at this point. Uh, he goes, let's have lunch. <laughs> So I, I, I told six people where I would be and what time I'd get back. And at lunch, he, asked, he, he says, I'm going to give you a job. I want you to head exploratory research at Polaroid with me. I'm going to you know, get a team of people and I'm going to give you three job uh, requirements. Make Polaroid a better company, do good science, and have fun. Well, that sounded interesting. but. I'm a medicinal chemist. I was planning on going into academia. I was going to work on, on cures for diseases and things like that. Then he told me how much he was going to pay me. <laughs> and I said, when do I start? Um, and so, next thing you know, I find myself surrounded by these beautiful people at Polaroid. And we are working on holography. We're working on instant photography. We're working on imaging systems. We're doing all kinds of different things. And while I'm working on different things, came up with this, this weird thing that I call non-covalent derivatization. Okay, and I'm not going to kill you on this one, but um, I am such a nerd. The license plate of my car is NCD for non-covalent derivatization. <laughs> Much to the horror of my children, um, you know, unless they want to borrow the car, then I say it's no can do. But, um, <laughs> but what non-covalent derivatization is, is it's molecular level biomimicry, if you will. You know, in 150 years of industry and chemistry, we have learned to make the most complex and complicated molecules imaginable. But we use high temperature, high pressure, and nasty reagents. Whereas nature outperform, constantly outperforms us, hands down, and yet uses room temperature, ambient pressure, and water as a solvent. 
And so non-covalent derivation is the scientific interpretation of what's going on. And, and the idea is that we, for 150 years in chemistry, have been ego-driven to make molecules do what we want them to do. And yet in nature, if you think about it, molecules do what they want to do because they evolved to do what they want to do. And if we can learn that, and we can understand how molecules interact, and I, I tongue-in-cheek say, play the role of a molecular psychologist. Instead of making the molecule do what we want, put it on the couch and say, what would you like? <laughs> and then design the product to be what it wants to be. Don't have the toxicity, don't have the hazards. It just seems to make sense. Well, one thing led to another, and all of a sudden, at Polaroid, we have this invention, and they call them Warner complexes. And it's these things that, that make the photography system work better. Um, we had to go to large-scale manufacturing of this. And in the, in the United States, if you have an invention and it works, and you're going to go to large-scale you know, manufacturing, you have to go to the EPA to get approval. There's a document called a low-volume exemption and another called a pre-manufacturing notification. So you sign all these documents and fill this stuff out and you send it to Washington. And we did, and we waited, and we waited, and we waited. And a couple months later, they rejected the application. Not because of toxicity, not because of environmental impact. They said, non-covalent derivation, what the heck is this? So I ended up flying down to Washington to give a seminar to the EPA about this technology. I'm holding my briefcase with overhead transparencies as before, you know, this electronic stuff, and a little bit nervous, a little bit mad, I'm going to give them a piece of my mind, and I walk up the stairs of the EPA, and I meet the branch chief of the Office of Pollution Prevention and Toxics, this guy named Paul Anastas. Huh. Remember the kid that I followed into the lab when I was a music major?